Melody is finishing a two-year appointment at AT&F, the US Digital Services Agency. She spent quite a lot of time working in public media, has done amazing work that if you have not looked at her website, I absolutely uh, recommend checking it out. It is probably amongst the most well-documented uh, 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 work that I've ever seen anybody do. She puts everything on GitHub. Uh, it's it's an amazing, amazing resource. She's going to share just a small piece of that today, um, but has just a, like a really, truly amazing um, set of resources. She's also currently a visiting uh, fellow at the, at the Neiman Foundation for Journalism. And her work spans um, so much, so I'm not going to drone on, but I'm going to give it over to Melody. And please welcome her with me. Thank you so much. Um, I thought I would start by showing you this website that was designed for my 89-year-old neighbor, Betty, who I took to Politics and Prose in DC for a book reading. And all of this is online. All of the links are online. You don't need to take pictures of this stuff, because I can send you the links. Um, and I took Betty to a reading, and I watched her read the New York Times. And she kept clicking on ads by mistake. And I thought, there needs to be a better news website designed for 89-year-old people. So I put out a query online. I said, I want to design a better news website for my 89-year-old neighbor, Betty. And this is the result. This is called News for Betty. Um, it's designed specifically for her. These are the news websites that she likes to read. These are the sections that she likes to read. And it basically just queries the API and shows her exactly what she needs to get to. Um, and then she can click on the link, and she knows to go back. Um, what this project demonstrates and what I'm going to be talking about today are ways to include community in the process of building things in newsrooms, and specifically in public radio stations. Um, as a little bit of background, I started working at NPR when I was 21 on a fellowship. I left the fellowship early to go to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, where I directed, edited, wrote for, and produced the show. Um, I left there to run digital strategy at Fresh Air with Terry Gross. Um, then I went to medical school. Then I dropped out. Um, and then I was a digital strategist and editor at NPR. And what that means was I developed products and tools that either made our newsroom more efficient or made us better interact with our audience. And I tried to include the audience in everything that we did. Um, what are, I currently work at 18F in the federal government. I'm on a two-year term appointment. Um, I try to make things in the federal government more accessible and transparent. And I took the role in part because I wanted to figure out how to work within a well-designed Skunk Works operation that I could one day potentially run or work with for public media. So these are the different things that I like to think about. I'm very, very open with my work. I try to build everything out in the open with the audience and for the audience. Um, I think that public media in particular should be doing that with everything that they build. I believe that all of the software in public media should be open source. I believe breaking news and investigative work should be Creative Commons licensed so it gets to the widest audience possible. And I think we should be including the audience more in what we do. So I'm going to start by showing you this picture of Yellowstone National Park, which was posted again. All of these slides are online. Um, so this is Yellowstone National Park. And this is me in fourth grade. And in February, President Obama announced that every fourth grader in the country is going to receive a free National Park Pass next year. And they'll be able to go to the national parks, as will their families. So these are my brothers, and these are my parents. So all of us would get to go to the national park for a year, which is really cool. People are going to be able to go to the national park that otherwise wouldn't be able to go to um, and experience the <coughs> national park. So let's think about what those fourth graders are going to be doing 30 years from now. Of course, they're going to have a fond memory of visiting the National Park with their family. But I think that they'll more strongly identify as supporters of the National Park. They'll feel satisfaction and loyalty towards the National Park. And they'll recognize the National Park for a vital public resource. So that's essentially what I would like to do, but for public media. I'm not talking about doing anything new. These are the things that I'm going to talk about today have already been done by other organizations and institutions. And I'd like to bring them to public media. But I'm going to pause for a sec, because I like making these things interactive, and just open this up to the audience and ask you the question, what does it mean to you to be a member of an organization? And I'm thinking of things like a YMCA, or a JCC, or a Girl Scout troop, or a gym. What do you get out of being a member of an organization? 
Anyone? Yeah. Sorry. A relation with similar thinking people? Anybody else? A tote bag. A, you, a tote bag, okay. And sometimes when you get sort of a little punched out on your sort of self identity and just ways to kind of identify yourself by affiliations. So identifying yourself through affiliations, these are all really good answers. Perks that come with the collective group versus individual efforts. So perks that come with being part of a collective group rather than thinking of yourself as an individual. Yeah, you're a contributor to that organization. So you're a contributor to that organization? Access to resources you wouldn't be able to obtain with just your own means. Access to resources that you wouldn't be able to obtain otherwise? Seems like a pretty good list. Oh, one more. Well, I like to contribute to the organization and push it in a better direction. So contribute to the organization and push it in a better direction. So a little bit of a change on that same question. What does it mean to you to be a member of a public radio station? For the people watching the webcast, there's complete silence in the room. <laughs> also, you should feel free to live tweet like all of this. I don't, yeah. Uh, funding the stories that we feel need to be funded. Funding stories that we feel need to be funded. Yeah. I don't have to feel guilty when they uh, keep asking for money. After <laughs> a, a lack of guilt <laughs> during pledge drives. <laughs> So this is a question that I've been asking a lot of people over the past few weeks. I started the Neiman Fellowship in early May. I've actually been working on this project since finding out that I got the fellowship last October. <laughs> and I've been asking people who work in public media and people who think a lot about public media and people who listen to public media and people who don't listen to public media. So out of all of the people that I've interviewed who do not work in public media, no one can quite identify what it means to be a member of a station. Um, people have said, you know, I feel like I should, and then I say why, and they're not able to articulate that. Or they say, I don't know what I get out of being a member, and they're not able to say anything more than that. And then I interviewed people who do work in public media, and somebody said, are you talking about tote bags? And I said, no, I'm not talking about tote bags. Forget the tote bag. What does it be, mean to be a member of your station? And they said, I'm not sure that we articulate that very well. And somebody else said to me, well, members get an e-newsletter. So I said, you send a newsletter out to members that you do not send to the rest of the people about events that people would pay for at your station? And they said yes. So membership is an idea that is, that is tricky in public media. Why am I telling you all of this? I've, I worked in public media for more than a decade. I plan to go back to public media. I really value and love public media. I think it's something that should exist in the United States, and I'm really increasingly worried about its future. Here's another question that I'll just pose to the group. Where's the public in public media? This is, this is something that somebody wrote in 1980. Um, I'll read it for you if, in case you would like that. Um, the uncomfortable fact is that most public radio stations do not serve significant portions of their community. This is true even though we support a goal of making our services available through the most efficient, equitable, and appropriate means. But radio stations with small audiences are not inherently efficient or appropriate. So this is something that was written in 1980, but I've heard people say this as recently as a month ago. So this is something that's been ongoing for the past 35 years. How do we include the public in what we do? One last question for the group. Are there ways to think about expanding what it means to be a member? Currently in public media, membership is based on a financial relationship. You give money to a station and you become a member. But i operating under the assumption that it doesn't have to be a financial relationship for something meaningful to take place. So I'm creating something that I call media public. I'm calling it that because it takes public media and turns it on its head. It's also a way of putting the public first. And it's saying, what would happen if we expanded the definition of what membership is? And I'm looking at other organizations who have already thought about this. So I'm talking to things like food co-ops and libraries and Code for America brigades and thinking about how in Code for America, the brigades work with cities and get technologists in those cities to think in different ways about the city in which they, they live. And food co-ops ask members to donate time or help with projects and have people feel more invested in their organization. 
or public libraries. Um, I live in Washington, D.C. My public library um, has created a maker space and activities for people who might never check out a book to come into the public library, use its space, and then advocate for the existence of the public library. And that's kind of what I think public radio stations need to do. So I'm operating from this mindset. What if we expand the ways in which somebody could become a member, and what might that look like? Um, this is just a list of things that I've thought of. I'm sure there are other meaningful ways to contribute to a station, but I'm starting with the list um, that I put together. What if you could donate code or participate in a hackathon? There are many reporters around the country who would like to do deep data dives and don't have developers on staff. What if we could partner them with a developer in their community who wanted to enhance his or her portfolio? Um, is there a way that somebody could tag or digitize an archive and become a member? Is there a way that somebody could do user testing for a new iteration of a public media website and become a member? Why are we solely basing membership on this financial transaction? So there are 835 physical spaces across the United States where public media stations um, <coughs> operate. Um, and this is the experiment that I'll be running over the next year. I've identified 10 stations that are doing a pilot project with me. Um, and they've each identified a cohort of people that they're going to make members of their station for a year for contributing in non-financial ways. Um, one of the stations is making people who conduct oral histories of people in their community, they're making the people who do those oral histories members. One station has seventh and eighth graders put together a PBS documentary every year. Those seventh and eighth graders are going to be made members. Um, in three cities, stations are going to partner with their local um, Code for America Brigade, and those people are going to work on mapping projects for the station that will enhance their ability to transmit information online. Then we're looking at what is automated in terms of emails that go out to those people. So if you become a member of a public radio station, about like eight months later, you, you get an email that says, are you ready to donate again? Do you want to pledge? You get a series of emails. If, if people are donating in these, this way, those emails need to be changed or stopped. Um, so we're changing and stopping that stuff. And then I'm interviewing the people who are in these cohorts and thinking about how they view public media now, how they're going to view it a year from now, and how that changes their um, relationship with the station. This is something that's already going on in different markets across the country on a very small scale. Last November, the Code for DC Brigade made the election website for WAMU. So people who worked at Code for DC coded this map um, that WAMU put on their website for election night. And in Rochester, New York, the station worked with the local Hacks Hackers Brigade to make this app, which allows the station to ask questions and receive answers from their community. So it, it's partnering already existing organizations that could benefit from each other together. Everything that I'm doing as part of this project is public, um, so you can follow along. I'm treating the Neiman Fellowship as a series of sprints. I've divided it into four cycles. Everything that I do during the sprint, I'm making public. Um, so I'm, I'm saying what would I like to accomplish over the next two weeks. Um, and then I'm articulating whether or not I've accomplished that. And I'm thinking a lot about the words that are currently used in public media to think if we can turn them on its head. So currently, pledge is associated with giving money. But what if by belonging to a public radio station, you are actually saying, I'm going to be a more engaged member of my local community, or I'm becoming more informed about a topic, or I'm teaching somebody in my community something that they should know about? How do we think about how people actively and constructively participate? And I'm using that phrase in particular because it's part of NPR's original mission statement, which was written by my friend Bill, who said, National Public Radio will serve the individual. It will promote personal growth. It will encourage a sense of active, constructive participation. And the way that I think a lot of public radio stations operate currently is as a distributor rather than a facilitator. And I'm thinking of ways to create more facilitation. So what if instead of membership being a financial transaction, it meant you belonged more to a community? So what if? A public radio station as a physical space meant a place where you could learn all of these different things. What is public media? I had somebody ask me last week, well, what is even the point of a local station? I get all of my news through the national network. And that really frightened me because the person who asked me that question was extremely smart. And I thought, oh, geez, like maybe I need to take a step back and explain the importance of local. Um, there are local stations all over the country that have very, very small staffs that are doing extremely good jobs of like civic reporting projects or reporting on local government or reporting on things that don't necessarily make money but need to be reported on. And I strongly value that and think that it's a um, model that needs to survive. So I'm really glad you're all here today. It was very nice of you to come out. These are the questions that I have for you. Um, I'm at the very start of this project. I plan to go back to work in July but continue to work on this project. 
I have people across the country who are developers and designers and um, UX people and like just really good thinkers who are helping me with this project. I would love it if you join that team. I have a GitHub. I can add you to it. Um, I have a listserv. Like I will just add you to anything that you want to be added to. The more the merrier with this. Um, and these are all the ways that you can get in touch with me if you'd like. Thanks. And I'll go back to that slide um, so we can begin to open it up. And there's some microphones that are going to run around, so just raise your hand and a, a mic will come to you. And this was like the 20-minute the version of the speech. I've given an Ignite talk, which was the five-minute version and an hour-long version. So if you'd like to hear this again much longer, happy to do that as well. <laughs> Hi. Uh, should I introduce myself? Yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ann Bennett. I'm a fellow at Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, but I work in public service uh, broadcasting in, in Africa. So um, I'm thinking of it from, from that perspective. Um, you know, we're always looking for engagement as well for, for a number of reasons, not just for the financial side, but also to improve our, the way that we serve our communities and our audience. Uh, but one of the things that we encounter over and over is, is on the editorial side, some pushback. Um, and, and this fear of, of sort of relinquishing any kind of editorial control to, to the audience that's out there. Um, you know, this idea that as journalists and editors, we're professionals um, and we know better than our audience. Um, have you encountered that? And I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on, on that as well. Thanks. Yeah, I, I was going to point out this project to you, which um, was created by my friend Jen, who worked at WBEZ at the time. Um, it's a project called Curious City. And it allowed people from the city of Chicago to post questions they had about the city of Chicago. And then the person who asked the question and the reporter would go out and work on the story together. And the, the person who posed the question asked different questions, asked in a lot of cases better questions, and was considered to be an equivalent reporter on the project. And it just shaped different kinds of stories that WBEZ began to tell. I, I think if we're not including our audience in the process, we're, we're missing out. It, it, we become like this, this broadcaster and, and not thinking about how we can horizontally build everybody up. Um, I, do, I have encountered pushback from editorial on, on these things. I'm thinking long-term survival. If, if we don't, the NPR aesthetic and the public radio aesthetic has been replicated by the for-profit sector. There are many podcasts that spring up now that sound like NPR that are virtually indistinguishable aesthetically from the NPR sense. So how do we differentiate ourselves? We say we're including the audience in the process. We're a trusted news source. We're, we're talking about things that we otherwise wouldn't talk about. And how are there ways to include the audience um, in the process that we might not have thought of? I'm just going to show you one more site. Uh, ProPublica has a page called Get Involved, where every single story that they post has a way for the audience to get involved. And it's sometimes as simple as asking the audience to share their story, which is a better way of saying leave a comment. <laughs> It's essentially just asking people to leave a comment. I'm not sure why that's not loading. Let me try to bring that up for you. Uh, um, yeah, here we go. Ways to get involved. So join the discussion. Ask a question. Take a quiz. Share your story. Um, it's ways of including the audience, but maybe not from day one, but maybe from day three. And in thinking about including the audience, I think that if folks have responses to other people's questions as well, please like feel free to jump in. This is by no means a Hi, I'm Rebecca Wexler. I'm a visiting scholar with the History of Science Department. And I am wondering if you could give us your definition of the public. Like, like people? Well, I don't know. If that's your definition, that'd be great. I'm just wondering. So you're talking a lot about public media or media public, turning those things on its head. And so is it, I, I, I have. I think, yeah. it, I, I think I would just say it's, it's, it's everybody who lives in an existing community. Like, how do we include voices from people who we're not currently reaching out to or not? Um, I'll show you something that might. Um, I ran this project uh, called 64 Ways to Think About a Homepage, where I put really smart people in a room and said, come up with a homepage that people in news haven't thought of yet. And one of the things that we talked about was, how do we get news to people who might be in public spaces? So how do we think of disseminating information to people who might be standing at a public um, transportation stop or, or might be standing in public? How, how do we not think of ourselves as, as being in a building and broadcasting on the radio, but, but talking to people on the street, including them? I, I would say the public is just people who live in a community or people who care about a certain topic or, or people, just, just people. <laughs> so. Does 
anybody else have a, either thought or comment on either of the questions that have been posed so far? Um, I wanted to quickly ask um, how much the platform plays into making it easier for audiences to participate. So if you see something like CNN I report, it's really simple. It's an Instagram. You take a, take a video and post it, and they, they sort of retweet it in a way. But yeah. then there are other systems that are very difficult for an audience to use and not as, um, you know, they're not willing to put in the effort to learn about the system. So I wanted to know what you thought. Um, the, the Platforms that I'm thinking of developing, one already exists and was created by the group that I work with in the federal government. It's called Midas. It allows anyone in the federal government to post something that they need help with and for people to sign up to help with that project. Um, so it's, it's really easy because we needed people who um, worked all across the federal government to be able to use it. This already exists. It's an open source GitHub project. And then I'm developing this website which would have all of this information in one place, allow people to share, connect people across public media who think like this with each other. Public media is very siloed. There's five Facebook groups, there's three Slack channels, there's like seven listservs that I'm on. People are not really talking to one another within the system. People are not sharing code with each other within the system. Um, the public certainly isn't invited into all of the processes going on. Um, there's no space for that right now. So I, th I think the best use of my time and energy is developing the central location for that. Um, I'm not a developer or designer, so if anybody has those skills and would like to work on this project or can connect me with people who can work on this project, this is a GitHub that I'm working on with several people. Hi. Hi, I'm Saul Tenenbaum, a local blogger, and I apologize for the tote bag snark. Um, um, I, I wanted to follow up on the first question in, and sort of unpack something you said early on. Um, you, know, you said you were looking at co-ops as a model and of people contributing um, time. But co-ops are really a ownership and governance structure. Um, I mean, you join a co-op and then you're a part owner. Um, I mean, you're not, you know, in tech, I mean, you're, you're working for the collective. Um, you haven't really, I mean, the, the first question sort of, um, you know, pulled at the, no, this is ours, we don't want the unwashed masses trying to tell us how to, um, you know, do our jobs. Um, I mean, are there people talking about actual co-op models? This is and a news co-op called the Banyan Project. It's a local website for the community of Haver Hill or Haver Mill, Massachusetts. Haverhill. Ha Haverhill. Haverhill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so people are playing around with this model. Um, I think, especially at the local level, for local to survive, w there has to be a model that's not based on strict local advertising. They, they've gone national. Yelp, Facebook, and Google are all based in California. People are sending their advertising dollars there because it makes more sense. How do you show value and, and get people to, you know, it, it's thinking about different news models. I don't think that there's a one-size-fits-all solution. I see folks from WBUR here. What works from WBUR doesn't work for uh, Arkansas public media. Um, but I do think that we need to be playing around with different models uh, and, and trying different models to see what sticks and what could work in a small market, a medium-sized market, a large market. I'm not worried about the top five to ten markets in public media. I think they're structured differently. They have different staffing models. Um, but from mid-sized to smaller markets, I really think that they need to think beyond um, underwriting both digitally and uh, on, on air. John? John David Al from WBUR. I figure if I'm going to get called out, <laughs> say I'm here. Um, there's a number of us here, I think. Um, you are, raise your hands. <laughs> Actually, maybe I'm the only, I think they all went over, I think we have various cohorts here. Of, for, we have community who is contributing to the well-being of BUR who's here. Um, I think you're really smart to not uh, look at things as monolithic and uh, sort of generalize across the system. I think there are larger stations, there are medium small, and small stations. They all have different needs and different resources. Um, one of the questions, and I'm, you know, even BUR, we do a lot of outreach. We want to do more outreach. Um, we try to 
get a confederacy of the willing as much as possible and we are looking always to partner with people who have great ideas and it comes down to even a station the size of ours uh, to bandwidth. Um, we only have so many resources to dedicate to this and I think how to organize that and create a structure which I think you're working towards yeah. and sort of a templated approach which I think would be extremely helpful. What I'm wondering about and we all want public radio to survive and we all are not the biggest fans of the pledge drives or other ways that we are, you know, other ways that we bring in revenue. Are there thoughts about taking sort of this coalition of the willing that you are bringing in to be part of and engaging the community, of using them as either ambassadors, cultivators of donations, identifying those people as donation uh, possibilities, using them as sort of the, the classic you know, fund funnel of engagement where people can actually provide us money so we can support the great work and reporting that we're doing. So I, I was talking to somebody at a different station who, who pointed me to this website, which allows people to say, I don't want birthday gifts this year. I want people to donate for this organization on behalf of my birthday. I, I think that you can treat people as ambassadors, but you have to show them why they should be ambassadors first. Um, and I think that people who care about different things in their community are willing to donate money, but it might not be the first thing you ask for. So you can say to somebody, help us with this project or help, you know, come in and, and be a user tester, help WBUR figure out this thing. And then a year from now, you send them a postcard in the mail that says, how would you like to become a member this year? Do you want to give 20 bucks or do you want to donate 15 hours of your time again? So you give, right. yeah. I'm sorry. Is, that, is totally. that part of oh, your yeah. overall project? Oh, yeah. Is yeah, that yeah. an outcome that you're, you know, as part of your project, I want to increase uh -huh. financial this is, support? This is based on thinking the ways that people, listening habits are going to change as internet becomes more um, available in cars. So the default for high quality audio in cars will not necessarily be public media. Um, donation habits for people under a certain age are radically different than their parents. And my concern is that stations think people will graduate into the listening and donation habits of their parents, and that's not true. Um, and if we don't start to engage with people now who are donating and listening differently, then we've lost them. And if the average age of a person donating, I think, to a news station is in their late 50s, the average age of a person donating to PBS or a classical station is in their early 70s, I think. If we think that people under those ages are going to graduate into those habits, we're, we're, we're thinking that the world has not changed in terms of the internet in the past 15 to 20 years. So I, I'm thinking, how do we get people, I hate to use the word funnel, I don't like to talk about this in marketing terms. I, I think that I, I prefer more community oriented language, but the idea is to funnel a certain percentage of people who take this action will eventually be into this cohort. You know, and we need to run those experiments now. And I'm talking about what are the experiments that we can run as a system to figure out what to do next. I, I'm not saying this is, you know, I, I got a lot of pushback when I first announced this idea from a lot of people at stations who said, she's, you know, she's messing up our entire business model. Like, what is she thinking? But no, like people who, my parents are always going to donate to WHYY financially, that, that's what they're used to and that's what they like doing. Um, people my age have no connection to WHYY in the way that my parents do and might not graduate into that. So it's thinking, how do you create a model so that they graduate into financial donorship that, that isn't based on what we're currently doing? Yeah. And I, right. <laughs> and I, I should also say that I, I don't think of myself as like standing on a little soapbox and like shouting this stuff and having people go through me. This needs to, I want every station to be like playing around with this stuff and not think like, oh, I have to go through Melody Kramer or oh, I have to wait for Melody Kramer. No, like if you have an idea and you want to run with this, like run with it. It's, it's, it's an idea to help the system. Um, it, it's not like it doesn't need to start with me or end with me. Yeah. Uh, Andromeda Yelton. I do a lot of things involving code and libraries and making trouble. Um, 
So along those lines, my consumption of public media is exclusively podcast oriented. And I find that I feel a strong sense of affiliation with a lot of the things I listen to, but they're produced by a variety of stations and non-station entities. And all of the, uh, the mechanisms I have for donating or getting involved are station-based. So is there a bridge somewhere between those two in this? I think if stations can articulate other ways you can get involved that also involve getting involved with a podcast, I'm, I'm going to, to ask stations to post different ways that people can get involved. So let's just pick a random podcast. Uh, there's a podcast called The Urban Amish that's produced by a station, I think, in South Dakota. Let's say you really wanted to help the Urban Amish podcast. The station from South Dakota could list that on their page on this site. Ways to help that would help that station because that station is producing that podcast. Um, you know, WMYC has something interesting on their page. Uh, on their Ways to Donate page, they actually say, you can help us by coding for us. What they haven't yet done is extending that to membership. So they haven't said, if you code for us and code well for us, uh, we'll make you a member. Um, I'm working with a guy who works at Code for America to make this website, which isn't complete yet. So I'm showing you something that might not even load. But the idea is that if stations have GitHubs, um, you can see what issues are open so that you can uh, you can help with those issues that are open. But I, right now, I'm starting with stations. The, there's a, no reason not to extend this to podcasts. So this is a map of the United States. Um, this allows you to click on any station with a GitHub project, to see what currently is up on GitHub. GitHub, for those of you who don't know, is version control software that allows people to work on software projects together. So I can, if we think of GitHub as creating a recipe together, I write, um, ingredients, you write ingredients, I say your ingredients should be added to my ingredient list, um, capiche? Uh, it's just doing that for code. So this is going to put all of the GitHub projects that stations use in one place. What this also does is say to stations, hey, no need to create that from scratch. Another station has already made that. Like, we don't need to reinvent the wheel 450 times. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, wait for the mic. <laughs> um, so I'm an intern at the Berkman Center. Um, What's your name? Jenny. And um, I was wondering what you kind of expect when you interview people who participate in public media that's like a non-financial participation, what you expect slash hope um, they'll gain kind of yeah. um, both in kind of like a substantive way, but also just in how they kind of perceive and conceive of participation. And also if you have any insight into how that might compare with people who pledge financial contributions. So I scraped OkCupid. Okay uh, which is a dating website. And I looked at people who had said that they have an interest in public media related terms, and it's really high. There's like thousands of people who list either NPR or Terry Gross in their OkCupid okay profile because public media says something about you. Like if you listen to public radio, it says that you're, you know, you like knowing about the world, that you're interested in the news, like you want to date other people who are like you. I've been running into a lot of people who graduate college or in their 20s and 30s and want to meet other people like them offline and not in bars. And there aren't many mechanisms to do that. Like there aren't places that you can go to meet other people like you, work on something meaningful together, make new friends, date, you know. It's, it's hard to find that if you're not religious and you're not into the bar scene, which a lot of people fall into that cohort, myself included. Um, and, and so if stations could be more of like a public space which attracts people who might want to um, meet one another, if stations could also operate more like a library where, you know, the library is open to everybody. And the library benefits from being open to anybody. Um, I talked to a community station in Utah, and they have a podcasting booth that if you're a member, anybody can create a podcast in their booth. That's amazing. Like, they get content that they wouldn't otherwise get from a community that they might not otherwise be attracting or, or speaking with or thinking about. Um, and, you know, if you think about uh, what public media is or what public media currently sounds like, it's very white, um, it's very male, um, it's very northeast, it's very professor, think tank, uh, journalist driven. If you listen to certain interviews, I can listen to an hour of an unnamed show and hear professor, professor, male, 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 white male, white male. I'm not hearing other people. Um, how are ways, how can stations be the spot where that opens up to a community that is not 
it doesn't hear itself on public radio, so it doesn't want to contribute to public media in any meaningful way. So I realize that that's very idealistic and, and not something that can happen overnight, but I think by opening up these spaces and creating these spaces where people can um, you know, meet each other, that there will be very real associations with public media and positive things. Um, my friend Alex told me to think of it as like a cruise ship director, points people to activities and then extracts herself from the process. So like you want to go to gambling, I don't know what people do on a cruise ship, but like <laughs> let's, let's think of it. cruise ship related activities, points people in different directions, you find a cohort of people in that activity and then you associate that activity with the cruise ship. Um, so what could public radio be associated with that it's not currently associated with? Um, I also think that um, in comparison to how people typically donate now, which is pledge financial, um, th there's a, People feel like, like he said, there's like a guilt complex involved. You know, th that's kind of what I've been hearing over and over again. I feel guilty, I listen, or I'm not sure what I'm getting out of this, but feel like I should. And I think that there's a better relationship that people should have with their stations rather than guilt. So, I'm going to jump in because I oh, yeah, took the ahead. mic already. Right? Uh, my name is Adrian. I'm uh, the community manager at Harvard Business School's digital initiative and then previously at the Boston Globe, Boston.com. Um, but I wanted to build on your idea of like this new model for uh, community in public media because I think I think though you don't want to go into the kind of revenue potential, like I'm going to go there because there yeah, is go. a significant portion. And I think sometimes when you're trying to convince people who are revenue minded, like by not bringing it into the conversation, they inherently assume that there's no potential there. Um, but if you think about churches and religious organizations as a case study, um, they're obviously like many of them are very well funded because when you're part of a religious community, you spend a lot of time there, you want it to, con you want it to continue to exist, um, and so you give them money. You also give them money maybe because you don't want to go to hell, but like, you know, maybe we I think that in. <laughs> like, <laughs> hypothetically, you know, you also give them money because you want that church to still be there because it's part of your community. Um, and especially in these like small towns where you see small and mid level uh, stations, the more personal connection that younger audiences can have with these stations, the more likely they are to go to bat for them when it kind of comes down to um, town to the tax of it. You know, like. Yeah. You know, and I, I should say, you saying that made me think of something. I have no business background. I, I was an English major in college. Like, if anybody can help me with the revenue part of this, like, that would be really helpful. <laughs> Thanks. I agree with you. I think that um, anything that stations can do to situate themselves as, in people's minds is more than just a broadcaster. I wrote this piece on my website called, If I Ran a Public Radio Station, What I Would Do. And I just, it's called If I Ran a Station. Um, and it was just different things people could do, like in a station to make themselves more community oriented. And then I tossed it back out to the, the audience and said, what would you do? And people came up with all of these ideas for what like an ideal station would look like. This is not going to happen. Like these 19 things are not, but, but if a station runs with one of them and says like, this is what we could do, like it gets people thinking in different ways. And there, there's also revenue for stations in this. Like I think that they could set up storytelling as a service. You know, how, how do you, the moth runs workshops for, organizations that to tell moth-like stories that help fund the moth. So are there models that stations could see themselves as, people who tell audio stories are so good at conveying information. Are there classes, workshops, things that they could run in their community that help people or communities tell their own stories or to help um, local organizations tell their own stories? I think there is revenue potential there. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that it's important to hear people with completely different opinions. However, I was a little bit surprised when you call on John and he said, we all, uh, I've learned at a very young age that we all never applies to everybody. Uh, all doesn't even go to the bathroom. Some people pee in a, floor, in a uh, bed. But I can't get out of my mind when you said it's virtually indistinguishable. Do you remember in a, your very first answer, you said it's virtually indistinguishable. I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Uh, it's okay. You were talking about the podcasts. Okay. Oh, and you, oh virtually indistinguishable yes, from the, yes, like the aesthetic. Yes, yeah. yes. So I want to address that for a second. Okay. If it's virtually indistinguishable and um, 
obviously majority of young people choosing not to um, donate to classical station unless they're in their 70s. Do we really need it? And if, it, if it's virtually indistinguishable, why do we need to have it public? I mean, if we're getting a government support, tax money, then we're competing with private businesses. And that's not a role of the government. In fact, it's illegal by constitution to compete with, for the government subsidizing to compete with private businesses. John? <laughs> Adrian? <Yeah. laughs> So I think that like with the rise of the internet, we're seeing this rise of privately owned public spaces, um, like Facebook, right? We, we use Facebook, but we don't own Facebook. We, don't, we have no control over what Facebook does because it's a private company. Um, the difference... Sure, I mean, in, in very large aggregate, we can have some control over Facebook, but I think it's been proven multiple times that you, know, you as a person, or you as a small group or community of people have very little control over what Facebook does. Um, as, you, know, you log on sometimes and Facebook's totally different. Um, but the difference is... All right, well, getting away from one specific case study, there are many examples of privately owned public spaces. If you want to look at physical spaces, there are many of the public, like the public spaces in New York City are private actually park. privately owned pieces of land that the company allows people to use. Zuccotti Park is one of them. Um, and, but the problem becomes when you want to use that space for something other than what that private company wants you to do with it. Um, and they have the power to say, no way, um, the, pro the, the difference is with actual public spaces that are owned in aggregate by a community is that you have more control over what is or isn't done to that space. So it's like Wikipedia versus, or like an open source, like kind of a, a nonprofit Wikipedia versus like a, uh, like a Britannica.com, right? Like, I think if the conversation becomes, should public media exist, we've gone in a different direction, and I'd prefer to just keep it on membership <laughs> and then address that afterwards. Because I, I want to hear from people who can help this specific project, and the question of whether public media should exist is, is not the, the point of this. Anyone else? Joel Abrams. I used to work at the Boston Globe on its digital properties. Um, I've been, and, and there, I spent a lot of time thinking, well, how does journalism pay for itself and, and that business model? And public media, I think, has a great advantage over that of, well, if, you, if you, the globe is asking you to do something, you're, you're benefiting a billionaire who owns it, loses a lot of money on it, but still. Um, whereas when your public radio station asks you, you are doing something for the common good. And so that, that provides an altruistic, mo an altruistic motive. It's not just um, guilt, but it's that, that flip side of it that why people support the organizations that they feel part of is because, oh, well, I'm helping to do good. I'm advancing a cause that I feel is important. And, and as Adrian said, it, it's important to have that public space and that different voices being heard. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of this as like public libraries, public parks, public, I, I'm lumping in a whole bunch of public facilities together. Um, and, and, you know, I think public libraries and public parks have tackled this really well. The National Park Service, people love it. People, people would advocate for the existence of the National Park Service because they get something out of it. Um, and I love what they're doing with the fourth graders. I think that that is just so smart on so many levels to think, you know, we're providing this ability to utilize this public space. And what they're giving them is the ability to park. So you can go to any public park, but they, there's a small parking fee, and that does affect people's ability to go. But if you say to fourth graders, you get to go, your families get to go, you get to experience this, you know, that person's relationship with that public space will change over time. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Mariel. I'm an activist based in Mexico. And I think that, I mean, I don't know if it's my oversimplification of this, but I think that what we're trying to do is to get people to see that there's a tangible value 
in being members, and that the challenge is how to make it tangible for certain audiences. And the one thing that got me to donate as a person under 30 uh, in Mexico to a medium was uh, being able to decide what stories got funded. So this outlet in Mexico started doing uh, scholarships for investigative journalists. Uh, they fund stories for a month. Uh, I mean, that's not how they use all their funding. But they said, some of the funding that we get from people will go to pay for certain stories. And because of the context right now, uh, they picked stories that would be banned by the government. So like pedophilia ring stories or um, disappearance stories, like stories that would get journalists in trouble with their government ads if they were pursuing them. And so being able to have a say in what stories would get funded, and they had like this transparent voting system where um, I don't know how many submissions they had, but then they picked like the top 10, and then they said how many votes each story got. Uh, I feel like it maybe doesn't solve the problem of how to get more members, like vol volume donations, but how to get those members to donate more, those who are your members already, like bidding on the depth of the donation. And so I think that, I mean, that's personally what had me donate mm -hmm. a large sum of money to, to this organization. E even without money, like running, running something like the Curious City Project allows people to have a say in something that is covered on the air that might be um, meaningful to a large group of people that a reporter in the station wouldn't have thought about. Um, extending this to what it would look like for an investigative journalist would be really interesting. Do you, do you have a mic? So my name is Liz, and I am also a Berkman intern. Um, my question is kind of, um, it's, so with the old model, when people, you know, pledged money to a radio station, they become a member of that station. And with a lot of these newer projects we're talking about, it's like this one project, you're crowdfunding for one project, or um, I was thinking of, um, some like science, I think Radio Lab did this once, and um, oh, or like the something else, like, the Money like a citizen it, science thing with like, like the this thing. pokey, the like the Planet Money makes a T-shirt. Like it was that one project, kind of thing. Yeah. exactly. It's one project. Yeah. So when you have something like that, and people are becoming members because you know they're giving their time, they're giving putting effort into one project. How do you say, okay, now you're a member of um, WNYC? Now you're a member. You're also a member of the station. I mean, do you have any? Is there any disconnect there with that? that you've come across I, I would say that when I, when I worked with a lot of reporters at NPR, I would say if, if you think your storytelling stops when the story is published, like the, you, the story doesn't stop at the, at the publication point and you move on to the next story, it then becomes how do you say what happened so that people realize the value of your reporting and then that becomes the, the story of the station. So l let's say... I'll give you an example. Howard Burkus is a reporter at NPR. He does a lot of work in, in mining, which I have to tell you is, is not something that's reported by a lot of publications because mining stories on the NPR website do not get a lot of traffic. Uh, but Howard has changed laws in West Virginia. And like that's a story that NPR should be telling, how Howard's reporting helped change laws in West Virginia. That's showing impact. That's not page views. That's not showing, you know, but th that had meaningful change in the state of West Virginia based on Howard's reporting. I, I almost think like, you need a unit internally to tell the story of the stories that are being told. That sounds very meta, but if, if you're doing this kind of public impact reporting, how do you tell the story of that to say, based on your donation, we were able to do this, we were able to tell these stories, these people were able to achieve this, and now we'd like to do this. And I'm happy to stay afterwards to talk one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I have nothing else planned for today. <laughs> so. Is there one last question before we wrap up? Otherwise, thank you to Melody. For thank you.